Well, hello, come in. Hi. Uh, do you know, I was glancing at this shelf up here um, where here's England's antiphon. You may remember right back in the day, the first time you came round when I I started pulling books off my shelf for you and the first one I pulled off was this one by George MacDonald, England's Antiphon. There's a picture of um, a picture of George Herbert there. And it was a wonderful uh, book I showed you. In fact, it's what gave me the idea for these little spells when you drop round on the library. Where he thinks of the poets of England as uh, were singing antiphonally one another, to one another across the, the sort of the choir space of our our literary imagination. And of course, MacDonald was a great uh, literary critic. Actually, next to the to the England's Antiphons books is is this book of unspoken sermons of his. He was a great preacher. But so I thought we should talk about MacDonald again. But in fact, MacDonald is best remembered now, and I certainly first encountered MacDonald as a writer of children's stories. Um, here, for example, in a really nice early edition, just as it would have is The Light Princess and other stories. This is actually three sort of extended fairy stories, The Light Princess, The Giant's Heart and The Golden Key. This is an absolutely classic. Uh, this is actually from the, uh, the Golden Key, the character Tangle being looked after. Um, they're kind of part fairy story, part kind of suggestive imaginative mythology, part comforting children's tale. But they give you the most amazing images to think with. And um, in fact, uh, well, let's just look at... Um, they had a huge influence on... Um, he, MacDonald, had a huge influence on both uh, Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. This is the famous, uh, more extended children's story at the back of the North Wind, in which the North Wind is herself a character and a kind of mystical character, and it's to do with the boy Diamond's kind of growth. And um, uh, there's the North, the North Wind's cloudy hair seemed blowing, seemed to blow from every direction all around him. This is uh, got the sort of early illustrations, some of which are more successful than others. I mean, the person who does these drawings doesn't do people terribly well but does things like this the storm and the ship at sea absolutely wonderful now i had a copy of the f the first mcdonald book i had which was um the princess and the goblin look at this this is north wind stooping down this uh, it's a wonderful giant numinous glorious figure um i had the princess and the goblin uh, in in an early edition like this but I can't, I can't find it. It must be in the garage somewhere. I must have had it. My, but I wanted to show it to you. But I also bought another. I mean, MacDonald is perennial, as I say, big influence on Lewis. So they continue to be reprinted, and sometimes with quite striking newer illustrations. So this is one um, illustrated by Nick Walton. Why don't you come over and sit down? And um, The Princess and the Goblin was the first one that um, I read. MacDonald is a is a high Victorian. I mean, he was born in 1824 and died in 1905. And the great children's stories are, I think, from the sort of 1880s. Uh, really, uh, but they've lasted. Uh, in fact, this story, The Princess and the Goblin, um, well, G.K. Chesterton said about reading this book, that he thought it was the most lifelike book that he'd ever read. And everybody was very so shocked and surprised because it has, you know, it has a, uh, uh, goblins and uh, in a mine trying to under, like, come in and undermine the cellars of the king's house. And it's got a mysterious great-great-grandmother who is simultaneously ancient and very young and has a spinning wheel and a bath that you can lie in that turns out to be the very stars of heaven and a fire of roses. You'd think... You know what's life like about you know what's realistic about that, but G.K. Chesterton said that, um, as it were, symbolically or allegorically, the story was absolutely true. That we find ourselves, as it were, when we're born, thinking about our own minds and souls and bodies, 
inhabiting this mysterious house because the house that the little princess lives in has lots of winding stairs and lots of different rooms and she can never quite find the same room again and she knows that somewhere up in the attic is this mysterious beautiful old lady who's also a young and who is full of shining wisdom and she also knows that mysteriously somewhere down in the cellar there's all kinds of undermining by the goblins going on and danger to the house and Cheston says that's exactly the way we are we're kind of aspiring and un being undermined at the same time and there's more to us and our no our lives and our souls and our hearts than we know it's like inheriting a great house you don't know all this and um and that there is there is light and enlightenment and guidance and that's to be had from a sort of a divine figure so um uh one of the brilliant ideas in this book is that the uh she can't always find the mysterious great-grandmother, but whenever she does, there's a blessing of some kind. And then eventually the grandmother, who's spinning all the time, spins this invisible thread which she puts into, into the princess's hands. So that even if she's in the dark and things aren't going well, she can keep her hands on the thread. And even when she gets lost, she can follow the clue, as it were, the thread that's been put in her hand and, and find her way back. And as an image of prayer or of remembering God it's wonderful but I suppose the most striking thing considering it's a it's a high Victorian piece is that the the quasi divine figure is a, is a woman no it's not a man there's a there's a, there's a sense of the venerable uh, ancient wisdom of this 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 great grandmother becomes the source of the divine and that's I think very remarkable let me just read you, just to give you a little flavour of it. Um, it's, this is about the third time that she goes up to see the grandmother, and each time she sees a little bit more. And she's been out in a, in a storm and has come back in and is desperate for comfort. Um, so, uh, come in, Irene, said the silvery voice of her grandmother. The little girl opens the door and it's quite dark, but she still goes deeper in and... Come in, Irene. From the sound she understood at once that she was not in the room beside her. Perhaps she was in her bedroom. She turned across the passage, feeling her way to the other door, and her hand fell on the lock. And again the old lady spoke. Shut the other door behind you, Irene. I always close the door of my workroom when I go into my chamber. Irene wanted to hear her voice so plainly through the door. Having shut the, the other, she opened it and went in. Oh, what a lovely haven to reach through the darkness and fear through which she had come. The softest light made her feel as if she were going into the heart of the milkiest pearl, while the blue walls and their silver stars for a moment perplexed her with the fancy that they were in re the reality, the sky, which she had left outside a minute ago, covered with rain clouds. I've lighted a fire for you, Irene. You're cold and wet, said her grandmother. Then Irene looked and saw that what she had taken for a huge bouquet of red roses on a low stand against the wall was in fact a fire which burned in the shapes of the loveliest and reddest roses glowing gorgeously between the heads and wings of two cherubs of shining silver. And when she came nearer she found that the smell of roses with which the room was filled came from the fire roses on the hearth. Her grandmother was dressed in the loveliest pale blue velvet, over which her hair, no longer white but of a rich golden colour, streamed like a cataract, here falling in dull gathered heaps, there rushing away in smooth shining falls. And ever as she looked, the hair seemed pouring down from her head and vanishing in a golden mist ere it reached the floor. It flowed from under the edge of a circle of shining silver, set with alternated pearls and opals. On her dress was no ornament whatever, neither was there a ring on her hand or a necklace or carcanet about her neck. But her slippers glimmered with the light of the Milky Way, for they were covered with sea pearls and opals in one mass. Her face was that of a woman of three and twenty. <laughs> Extraordinary, vivid image of, as it were, the divine glimmering through her. But of course the most moving thing, certainly for me, is the fire of roses and there's a bit where Irene's all, or uh, the princess calls her, the great grandmother calls her to, to embrace her and Irene says, but I'll get your, your beautiful dress all messy because I'm covered in mud and 
And the grandmother says, embrace me anyway. And then she takes one of the roses from the fire and she just wipes it over all the stain and soil and it's gone. So this is that refining fire we talked about when you called last time. But now it's roses. And so it's the it's the beauty as well as the holiness of God. And I don't think you notice the fire of roses is between two cherubim, which is like the Ark of the Covenant. So it's a wonderful story for children, but as you go back as an adult, it's full of new resonance. And indeed, I think probably Eliot was remembering it. I mean, he's remembering Dante too, when he says at the very end of Little Gidding, the fire and the rose are one, or of which the flame is roses and the smoke is briars. There's something powerful, uh, archetypal about the way MacDonald makes these images. Um, and the whole book, is like that. There's, there's quite a nice illustration of that moment with the roses and the fire and the sense that the room itself is the starry heavens. I think that's quite a good picture. Uh, so anyway, if you haven't read or if, uh, The Princess and the Goblin, I commend it to you. Uh, and it's always good to reread it. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful story, uh, as I say, for children, but for full of after things for adults. And and uh, you can see how much both Tolkien and um, Lewis learned from MacDonald. Anyway, thanks for dropping by.